in an upper room. Not just any upper room, but an upper room filled with disciples of Jesus on that never-to-be-forgotten Easter evening. We remember what we've seen so far. The women went to the tomb, and they found it empty, and Mary Magdalene raced back to tell the disciples that the body was gone. And Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved raced to the tomb, only to find it was exactly as Mary had told them. And they returned home. Mary stayed at the tomb and discovered three persons there, two angels inside the tomb who had not been there seconds before, and a gardener who is anything but a gardener until he spoke her name and everything was changed. She returned to the disciples to tell them the great good news. I have seen the Lord. Last week, we saw the disciples hiding behind locked doors until they too had an encounter with our risen Lord. But when they tried to share the good news with one of their own, Thomas, he couldn't believe it until he had his own encounter a week later. Our lesson today is another look at that first Easter evening, this time from the perspective of Luke's Gospel. Immediately before our text was the account of two disciples on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. These two disciples had been traveling and discussing the events of Holy Week when they were joined by a stranger who questioned them about their obvious distress. They explained their hopes and dreams and how they had all been crushed the previous Friday. Evidently, they had heard the women's story of the tomb being empty and of meeting angels, for they recounted their story too. The stranger then opened the scriptures to them. However, it wasn't until they prevailed on him to remain with them in Emmaus, and he broke bread, that they recognized him. He disappeared, and they rushed back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they had seen the risen Lord. Hallelujah! He is risen! When they arrived, the disciples were already saying that Jesus had risen, for he had appeared to Peter. The two disciples shared their story of the risen Christ as well. As they're doing so, Jesus appears in their midst. You may remember from last week that they were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jews, specifically the Jewish authorities. And even though they've been discussing this very event, the actual presence of Jesus terrified them. Jesus' greeting words of peace be with you did little to alleviate the disciples' fear as they thought they were seeing a ghost. Now, 
before we discount this reaction as one of superstitious and uneducated people, let's remember that the doors were locked, that he appeared suddenly in their midst, and there was absolutely, positively no question that he had died on the previous Friday. Would you have reacted any differently knowing just those facts? Jesus offers them proof that he is not an immaterial ghost. He tells them to examine him carefully. He is solid, flesh and bones. He shows the terrible wounds on his body. This is him. Those wounds make it obvious. And then to erase any further doubt, he asks for something to eat. Ghosts and the dead have no need for food. He is truly there. This is no mass hysteria, no hallucination. He's no illusion, no figment of their collective imagination. Yet, we cannot forget that though he is truly present, there have been some changes. Those disciples on the way to Emmaus, though not of the twelve, obviously knew the Lord well, but they didn't recognize him until he broke bread. In that common action that they had no doubt seen him perform many times, that opened their eyes. This tells us that Jesus' resurrected appearance was real. But it was also mysterious. It's beyond human understanding, but it's entirely real and not imagined. Yet even with these proofs, the actual appearance of Christ, they still didn't understand the meaning of his death and resurrection. So Jesus unpacks the words that he spoke throughout his ministry and showed them how everything written about him in the scriptures had been fulfilled. He interprets all of this so the disciples can understand. Wow, that must have been an incredible sermon, don't you think? Wouldn't you have loved to have been there too, to hear it? I know I would. Jesus showed them that far more than a miracle, his life, death, and resurrection were the way that all of God's promises had been fulfilled. All the promises throughout history as one commentator put it, at the same time, the crucified and risen Jesus becomes the clue for understanding the scriptures. While they provide the context for understanding him, he provides the key for unlocking their mysteries. The two belong together. Finally, Jesus details and gives them unequivocally their upcoming mission. They are not to keep the good news to themselves. No, they're to go out and preach repentance and forgiveness. To begin in Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish world, and then from there, go out to all the nations. This word was not to be limited to just one people, their people. It never was. Remember, 
the words that God spoke to Abraham, how his descendants were to be a blessing to all peoples. These disciples were to be witnesses to God's actions, and they were not going to be doing it on their own, for power would be given to them. Just as scripture and resurrection were linked, so too was the mission. A clear vision of this mission is heard in our reading from Acts. It happened a time after Pentecost. Peter and John had been asked by a crippled man for help outside of the Jerusalem temple. The man expected to receive alms. This was the only way he could support himself in a time without any social safety nets. There was no social security, no disability payments, and we take those for granted, don't we? The healing of this man, this crippled man, generated amazement among the crowd who wondered how could these Galileans do such a thing? Perhaps some even remember another Galilean, but if they didn't, Peter certainly reminded them of him as he took no credit for the miracle. Instead, he preached a sermon filled with judgment and hope, condemnation and forgiveness. Like others, this text has been used to promote other anti-Jewish sentiments. But even a cursory reading shows us two things. Those indicted aren't just the Jewish people, but all of humanity. As Paul writes, all have sinned and fallen short. And those spoken to, even if they weren't directly involved, were equally guilty. And this also points back to Jesus' own disciples. Remember a time when they denied him, when they ran away? However, condemnation is not the final word. For here is hope and new life. And it's shared with them by their fellow Jews. Peter proclaims not only new life raised by God, who has corrected all that evil that has been done, but new power is now being given in the world. Power which healed that crippled man. The resurrection wasn't an end, but a new beginning, a fresh start. Judgment has led to healing and to forgiveness. Proof of God's unchanging and unfailing love. The previous evidence would have been well known to the crowd in the temple that day. As Joseph observed long before, when musing over the failed efforts of his brothers, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. What then is the word for us today as modern day disciples? What has changed? And what has remained the same? Well, our world still needs to hear the good news that He is risen. More significantly, though, the world needs to know why this is important to them. The need for salvation and a Savior. Scripture witnessed his coming long before he came. Scripture called people to new ways of living.
living different from their neighbors. The prophet Micah recorded these words. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Scripture witnesses God's mighty acts. A response is required. Do we follow our risen Savior out into the world, listening for his voice and in doing as he commands? Or do we want to hide behind locked doors? Cowering in fear, worrying what the world might say about our proclamation. My friends, Scripture is clear. Our Lord and Savior is clear. We are to go out and witness to the good news of the gospel. Salvation has come. New life 